So without further ado, wonderful speaker. If you have not heard Patty Salen speak, you're about to. Um, we are so grateful for all the work that she and her team does. And so without further ado, please welcome Patty Salens, Dr. Salens. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to be here um, for such an important topic. And no better to start today um, with our game plan of what we need to do to get through this crisis. And thank you again to the council for everything they've done to set this up today to give us this opportunity to be here. Um, it, it truly is something that is um, needed in our community as we've just heard um, from Chris. Um, and that's not the isolated case of, of our community, unfortunately. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit today about um, our why. Why do we think this is happening? I want to talk about the compounding factors that maybe have forced this issue to a crisis. I want to talk specifically about Queen Anne's County. I know not everyone here probably is from Queen Anne's County, but specifically about our schools, where we've come um, as it relates to COVID, and really what our next steps are. Um, so that's what I'd like to review today. So I want to start back with something from the beginning of time um, as primal as we are from our, that humans are social beings. We are, we, we actually thrive on it, we live by it, and if we don't have it, then it, then it hurts our well-being, our, our mental health. And so isolation um, can do some pretty big damage to people. And um, we, we, we socially reach out in every type of form to be social beings. We are programmed that way. Um, we're programmed to share our feelings and our thoughts and to create emotion around us. And that's really important to understand as we look at the platform for social media. So I know that we can all understand that social media is very popular. <laughs> and it's very popular because we're social beings and we like to interact with each other. And when we can't be face to face, then that gives us an opportunity to still make those connections. So, Take it all the way back to 1844. That was the first time that there was actually social interaction that wasn't face to face. That was your first um, social media right there. Taps, dots, dashes. I'm not an expert at it, but I can tell you that it worked. And believe it or not, they had messages similar to what we did. I mean, today I know we use OMG, oh my God, or LOL, laugh out loud. We do it every day. I do, I know, I'm guilty of it. Well, they did the same thing, GM, good morning or SFD, stop for dinner. That was actually one of the worst codes early. 1844, the way back then, is how they first started to have social interactions that weren't face-to-face, -face, but were, in a sense, kind of that I am, that immediate type of messaging. So when did it really start to spread? Because obviously it didn't start to spread in 1844, right? So when did that social media really start to, to spread out? And we can see here that chat rooms started in 1984. We all know what those were. I think all of us in the room are old enough to know that you went onto your computer. Actually, it was a desktop more like this probably over here, a lot bigger. And you went into and you could type back and forth just like we do for I Am. And you could talk to somebody about, you know, what, whatever you like to read. I'm a Grisham fan, so I might go to a Grisham chat room or whatever. Could be about vacations. It could be to meet a new friend. So that's how it really all started. And then blogging came into place in 1999. And then you see the, the major platforms start to roll in the door. So LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So those platforms rolled in. And they really set a foundation for social media. And it was like this explosion of consumption of social media during that time. And not necessarily for our age group, for those that were a little bit more attuned to um, electronics. So <clears throat> setting this huge platform and this foundation, and you'll see that you know, we're starting to be able to grab data because it's been 10 to 12 years now, 10 years just before the pandemic. So we were able to, to grab some data. And I wanna share a side story. Um, so you're gonna learn a little bit about me today. So every year in November, my mom and I go to Williamsburg to celebrate my birthday. We, now we go down to really go Christmas shopping, but we don't get a whole lot of Christmas shopping done, I will admit, but we have a, a really good time. And we always go to our favorite restaurant Friday night and it's always packed, line out the door, it takes us a while to get in. And so this is probably around 2016-ish, somewhere around in there. 
And um, so we're sitting at the booth and we're just chatting about what the next day is going to be like. Okay, what are, we're, what's our plan of action for the outlets tomorrow and what coupons are we going to use and everything. And all of a sudden we kind of stop and we're, we're looking at each other and it's weird because the restaurant's almost quiet. I mean, it wasn't quiet like a pin drop quiet, but it was kind of quiet. So we're looking around and everybody's on a device. Every single person. Even the waitress was on a device for obvious reasons. The bartender was on a device for obvious reasons, like a computer screen. But every table was full. Everybody at the bar, everybody had their face down in their device. So I looked over my mom's left shoulder and I saw this family there and I just couldn't take my mind off of them. So it was a family, a mom and dad would appear to be with two young boys, probably in middle school, a daughter that looked to be about elementary school, and all of them were on their devices the entire time. The entire time. So much so that the waitress came over and she even had to like interrupt them to take their order and to deliver their meal. And at that point, my mom and I sat and had a conversation like, what is the impact? What is the impact of this right here on our kids? So yes, it's a social tool, but is it really providing that socialization that they really need? It was interesting, very interesting. So I don't want anybody to leave from this room today saying that Patty Salen said that social media is awful for people and you should never do it. No, social media should be a balance, just like everything else in our life. And so social media has some good points. You meet good people. I mean, jobs, you got Indeed, you got LinkedIn, you got real-time news that we've never been able to have. And so there's a lot of good things that you can use on media, um, social media platforms. But I really want to talk about the negative impacts. That's why we're here today. We're focused in. We're, we're, we're literally in a crisis. We are absolutely. So I, I kind of parallel today, just like Queen Anne's County um, goes purple. And every year we come together in September and we do this kickoff to combat that crisis. And I think we've done an amazing job. But today's the day we need to do a kickoff because we are in a mental health crisis for our children. And so I really want to talk about why. Why are we in this crisis? And we're, we're in this crisis. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brain. And I'm not going to get all technical. Um, but in our brain, we have a reward center. And that reward center sends us happy hormones called dopamine when we do something that makes us feel good. So again, you're going to learn a little bit more about me. So I absolutely love pizza. I could eat pizza morning, noon, and night. I know I just must be a kid at heart, but I just like pizza. I could have any kind of pizza, white pizza, regular pizza, doesn't matter. I like pizza. And I also like JT, James Taylor. He's my favorite artist. I could listen to him all the time. So probably a favorite activity would be to get off work on a Friday night, go home, some blare some JT, singing some JT, and, and eating some pizza. That would be my favorite. And that whole time, my brain, my reward center is sending me out these happy hormones that says, that's making you feel good. Have another slice of pizza. Play another song of James Taylor, right? And that's great. And I'm an adult, and I know that doing that on a Friday night is fine. But I can't eat pizza every day, all day long for the rest of my life because I'd be overweight. I'd have issues with my blood pressure. Maybe I'd be a diabetic. It just doesn't make sense, right? Anybody, it's just silly to think that. And I certainly couldn't listen to James, James Taylor all the time because I wouldn't be able to get to work and get my bills paid or whatever. So as an adult, we have the capacity to make that decision of what's good for us. And when it feels good and it makes us happy and makes us warm fuzzy, and gives us that good, fun, happy hormone, we know that that's great, but we can't do it all the time. We have to have a balance in our life. But our young, vulnerable children don't have the same skills we do. And that's what we need to give them as those skills. So let's change the, the storyline and say that, you know, Patty's 12 years old. She's on the weekend, her parents are heading to St. Michael's on the boat off the dock, and she jumps on there and she takes her cell phone and she starts taking selfies. Seems about right for a 12, 13 year old, right? And she starts posting them on her social media. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, I don't care. But then she um, posts it on there and she starts getting recognition by likes, whatever, recognitions. And every time she gets one in her brain, what's it gonna do? It's gonna send out that happy hormone that says, this is cool. Yeah, they like me. I must be pretty. Yeah, they're, they're my friend. I must be great. Everything's wonderful. 
and she tracks herself by that. And so she sends another picture because the first one went over so well, she continues to do that and continues to do that. But then she notices that Amanda also was on the boat the other day and she was posting pictures and Amanda got a lot more recognition than she did. So then she starts to look at herself and decide, hmm, you know, I must not be very pretty. Amanda must be prettier than I am. People must like her better than they like me. And you can obviously see that they start chipping away at their own self-esteem. And they start chipping away and making their own story. And my mom always taught me, she said, you know, if someone doesn't tell you the story, you tend to make the story up. It's what happens all the time. And I always say that at work. I say, if we don't tell the story behind the data, then someone else is going to make up the story for us. So we need to tell our story. But kids can't always do that. So she makes up her own story. So I make up my own story about Amanda. And Amanda's life must be amazing and wonderful. And mine obviously must not. And this is what our kids deal with every single day. Every single day. And that's the part that we need to be able to to get in and modify. That's the part that we need to educate and provide the skill level for them to be able to look at it and make sure that that image that they took, that picture, is not who they are. And you know, being popular today is so different than being popular in our day. I mean, it's just different. And it's so hard, it's hard. And I think that's where we really need to begin. And I, I, think, uh, I think about Robin Williams. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. And I made up my own story for Robin Williams. Um, he must be the most amazing, must have been the most amazing husband, the most amazing, lovable, funny dad, the best brother anyone could have, the best son anyone could have. I mean, how could he be wrong? He's just like the most amazing person when you see him act. And yet, he lost his battle to mental illness. He did. I was shocked. I don't know if anybody else was. I was completely shocked about that because I made up my own story for him. So this is where we are. This is very recent, April 15th, 2022. This is pre-pandemic. So remember we were talking about that timeline of when those, that foundation was set? So that foundation was set and now this was 10 years later. 10 years later was the data and we see that 40% increase of our students in high school feeling perpetually sadness and hopelessness. This is the crisis that we're in right now. Because can we possibly imagine what it's like now that we've been going through COVID? I, I, I don't even know. I know you said 60%. And I don't even know. I don't know if it's, if it's 50, 60, 70%. I don't know. I just know that it has to be increased from here. So there's two rules that I live by for kids. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm just, I'm just in, I'm invested. And there's two things that I truly believe for kids. And that is, don't ask them to deal with, with adult issues. They're kids. Let them be kids. And don't put them in a situation that they cannot control. I remember my daughter, as clear as day, her first year in grad school, she's on her own, she's paying her own bills, you know, car payment, groceries, electric. I remember calling me saying, Mom, I don't like this adulting thing so much. <laughs> and we do laugh about it all the time, because she'll call me and she says, I don't feel like adulting today, Mom. Um, but it's true, we shouldn't, we shouldn't put that. And look at what COVID has done to our kids. We absolutely, we gave them things that were adult issues, like, I don't have food to put in front of you today. You don't have internet, you can't connect to your teacher today. Those are adult issues, those are not kid issues. And talk about situations they can't control. No prom, no graduation, no birthday party, no Christmas with your family. Serious stuff, some really serious stuff. So COVID, whew, I wanna take a step back because it really, it's hard even just thinking way back to the very beginning. So I'll share with you just a little, a little of the forefront of what we were dealing with. So on March 11th, we get an email, a superintendent's, that says that the governor and our state superintendent are gonna do a news release, press release, in the evening. And just FYI, you should be there. We got zero heads up other than that. 
So I, of course, was in Caroline at that point, called together all the principals, the board members, and some key players, um, assistant superintendent, um, your um, transportation person, your food service person, and we all come to one room and um, watch as it unfolds. So um, turn, turn the TV off and we say, we gotta create a plan of action. And that's what we did. We created a plan of action. We did the very best that we could to make sure that the very next day, because that, well, that, that was Wednesday, so that Friday when the kids went, that Monday we would have food delivered to houses and made sure that kids that needed packets got what they needed if we couldn't get it together by that Friday. Um, and then subsequently, as everyone knows, we were closed down for that entire um, spring and students weren't allowed to come in. Nobody was actually allowed to really be anywhere. Everybody was kind of on lockdown. But we did the very best we could to connect with kids, but we couldn't connect with all of them. And I know that everybody knows that. And so that summer we were able to get our highly need students in, your special education, English language learners, and, and by that fall, on the first day of school, the governor came to Caroline County. We were one of the only districts that had students in session. And we continued to bring kids back and had uh, most of our kids back. Um, by, before Thanksgiving, we had all of them back. Um, and then by second semester, we were well on our way, and, and it was good. In Queen Anne's County, they were able to get um, uh, CCTC students back, some special needs um, students back um, early, very early on, and then um, by second semester they had everybody back on a modified schedule, which was great and amazing and such a heavy lift for so many people. Um, and, and again, we did the best that we could with what we had, but it wasn't good enough for some kids. It just wasn't good enough for some kids. And some of our kids had to deal with those adult problems and they had to go to work and they supported their family when their mom couldn't or they lost their caretaker to COVID. It, it was hard. So our enrollment was down this year and last year to combine 380 students. That's significant. Now some of those students are in private schools, some of them are homeschooled, successfully so, and that's the right thing for their family, and kudos to them for knowing what was good for their family and making sure that their child got what they need. But some of our kids we just lost, and we won't get back. They either decided not to come back and they're working, as I said, to support their family, um, kind of missing in action type thing. So. Hard, hard, hard. Someone also asked me to address today of if I had to, to really hone in on who did I think was needed the most out of all the grade bands, who would it be? And I would have to say that I feel like our second graders, because they missed their total foundation of reading, and, and I would have to say our ninth graders who missed basically their entire middle school career and they have struggled. Our ninth graders have struggled and our second graders have struggled. And the good news is, is that we have a lot of grants and a lot of money that are coming down filtered to us where we have been able to target some of those um, interventions and some tutoring opportunities for kids. We've been able to partner with different companies. We've offered tutoring before school, during school, after school, um, even as late as people can pick up the phone and get a tutorer at nighttime. We've contracted with some different folks to do that. So um, we have a good plan of action and we're, we're certainly in the right direction, but I can tell you that it's, it's certainly been a heavy lift and, and we certainly haven't been able to, to meet the needs of every single student like we would have if we were in bricks and mortar the whole time. So then we, that takes us to the beginning of this school year, which we thought was going to be fantastic. We had this robust um, middle school, I mean robust after school program, not after school, a robust summer school program <laughs> last year in, um, in July and um, the end of June and July. And uh, students came in, no masks. It, it really was amazing. We, we served over 1,000 students in summer school programming last summer. We thought this year we're gonna just kick off, run right in the door, no problem, everything was good. Principals were geared up, ready to go. And then we had this. And we go right back to giving kids situations that they can't control and also putting kids in situations um, where they are in the midst of an adult decision. So we had masks versus no mask. We had vaccination versus no vaccination. 
We had quarantining versus no quarantining, and we had testing versus no testing. And it was a challenge. Again, it was a challenge, but this year we, you know, I can say that we were open the entire school year. We didn't have to close any one school for a spread, um, and teachers amazingly were able to um, get students caught up and focus in on um, some strategies to be able to, to fix the gaps that were there. And for next year, we've planned, um, we even have some of our teachers that are looping, and that's a strategy in education that we use where you already have a relationship with your students, so I'm gonna move up a grade with them so that there's no you know, downtime in the beginning to set relationships, so you, those relationships are already set. So we have some good strategies in place, and we also have another robust summer school program planned and prepared and ready to go, and we're excited about that. So with all that being said, you looked at the, the statistics prior to the pandemic, and now you just looked at what we've been through during the pandemic, and there's no surprise to you that this is our kids right now. And if you look in there, you see anxiety, exhaustion, um, you know, pain, panic. I mean, this is where a lot of our kids are sitting. And I know that you all are healthcare providers, many of you provide services, and I know that you know this because you meet with these students who are, their fuse is lit right now, and they're just about ready to lose it. And so, what happens when you have a time bomb ticking, right? Obviously, you're gonna have some repercussions of that. And so while we don't have any solid data this year, we can, we know, anecdotally speaking, that we've seen misbehaviors um, on the rise. We've seen fighting on the rise. And I kind of equate it to, and I know this sounds a little silly, but you know, a, a, a two-year-old, um, who is aggressive, maybe bites somebody. I don't know if you had a two-year-old that ever bit somebody at daycare. I don't want to talk about who might have had that, but at least she bit her own brother. I mean, you know, at least she bit her own brother. But anyways, it's like you tell them, use your words, right? Use your words. And I feel like our kids haven't been able to use their words because they haven't been able to access that person to use their words. And so they're, they're headed this direction. And specifically speaking, Dramatically so, in the fall of 2019, we only had 11 referrals for physical aggression. And this fall, we had 50. So, again, not being able to use their words, not being able to access what they need, um, to be able to express what they're going through. I mean, we don't know what they're going, I don't know what they're going through. I mean, I'm one of the lucky ones. I haven't lost anybody in my personal family to COVID, but a lot of our kids have. A lot of our kids have. And, and how do they deal with that? It's hard enough for us to deal with the death in our family. How, how does an eight-year-old deal with it? A 10-year-old, a 16-year-old? It's hard. So in Queen Anne's County, what we decided to do this year was to do a needs assessment to start building for a strategic plan. And during that needs assessment, um, we came out with five different themes. And one of those themes was the well-being of our students. And so that's actually one of our goals. And we've back mapped that goal. And what do we need to do in order to meet students' needs? Because we know that this is a crisis. So this current school year, we put in two new float nurses. We also put in two um, mental health providers in the form of like social workers. and. Believe me, that hasn't touched it. Next year, because of strategic planning and the need that is there, we've added two additional guidance counselors at two of our middle schools, and we're also adding, and again, two additional um, social workers. And we have back mapped that out to what do we need to continue to add. Um, and it would be great if we had the money tree that fell out of the sky and we could hire uh, you know, tenfold that. It would be amazing, but we really do have to build it into our budget. Um, but we're planning for it. We know it because our kids need to access those services. We have been um, <clears throat> creating and, and stabilizing existing rela relationships that we have as it relates to mediation, as it relates to community partnerships with For All Seasons and many, many others. And so I feel strongly that we will continue those and to be able to bring those services into schools. Another thing is, is working with the commissioners, we have um, been pursuing um, 
transportation for summertime, so it's great. We've got our kids in session right now, and our kids are getting services right on our property right during school, but what happens when summer comes? So we're trying to make sure that there's no disconnect between um, those services and that, they are, that it's smooth through the summer months. So we have a lot of work going on behind the scenes with the team. But today, if we can do anything at all of before we leave this room today is make a pack that whatever we do, we get this message out to our kids that it's okay to not be okay. Like that should be our message. It's okay to not be okay. That should be a normalized conversation. That should help us to remove the stigma that's there. It should really be an opportunity for us to provide the supports we need and get early intervention into the, to our kids. But our kids need to understand that sometimes, you know what, when you fail a test, it's awful. I get it. It's terrible. But it's OK to feel that way. You should be upset. You studied really hard. You put a lot of time and energy into it. So we need to teach them that when things happen, you're suppo it's, it's normal to have those kinds of reactions, that it doesn't mean that it is the end of everything, that what does it look like next? And what I do with my own son, who has been challenged with social anxiety, and I say to him, you know, he's got this big test, he's wound up, he's a nervous wreck, and I mean, anxiety out, out the roof, and I say, okay, what's gonna happen if you fail the test? Well, if I fail the test, I, I might fail the course, Okay, what happens if you fail the course? Well, well then I might have to repeat it. Okay, so what happens then? Well, then I'd have to put this class off to the following. So, okay, okay, but it's not the end of the world, right? You can always make it work. So sometimes just giving them that pathway of, yeah, it does, it's terrible, it stinks, but what's next? So it's, all, it's okay to be okay. And I really wanna end with this. And I know this is going to seem like the silliest little thing in the whole wide world, but for me it's very, very powerful, is the word routine. Routine. And I don't know if you've ever seen, I'll go back to that two-year-old that's off their routine. It's a nightmare, isn't it? Like we keep our kids little. We keep our littles on a routine for a reason because it makes our life easier. It makes their life easier. But why do we stop that? Why is it that when they get to upper elementary school, into middle school, into high school, that we don't, we don't encourage and almost demand that they have this balance of a routine, a balance of, of eating well, of sleeping well, of exercising well, and socializing well. So instead of having free reign to this all the time, there should be, and there's two different kinds of socializing. There's socializing online, and then there's socializing. And we need to make sure that our kids have that routine, and we need to be good stewards of that. We need to make sure that we are good role models of that. And I try to do that every day with my kids. Every day, balance. Mom, can I have this? You know, when they were little, can I have this candy? Sure. Can you have 25 pieces of it? No. Everything in moderation, right? Everything in moderation and routine. Stick to a routine. I tell you, our kids thrive on routines. And honestly, me, I'm grouchy when I'm off of my routine. I really am. I haven't been well. I wasn't well last week. And I haven't been able to work out. And it's gr I'm grouchy. Like, that's my outlet. You know, and I'm just a creature of habit in the morning. I have a routine, I get up and I play words. You guys are learning much too much about me. But I get up in the morning, like first thing, I just wanna play my words with friends. Five minutes tops, five minutes. And at night to like bring my head down, I just wanna play my words with friends. Like, it's like easy, but it's part of my routine and it's not excessive, it's in balance. So if anything we can do today before we leave is to really think about it's okay to be okay and let's get our kids in a good routine. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk on such an important topic. You guys have been amazing.